<laughs> okay, uh, sorry for interrupting your uh, very active discussions on everything. Uh, welcome to physics and astronomy classroom. Uh, today, our speaker is uh, Dr. Liang Tan. Uh, he got his uh, bachelor's degree in physics from Caltech in 2008 and then PhD in physics from UC Berkeley in 2014. He then joined the University of Pennsylvania as a postdoc in the uh, chemistry department there. And today, uh, his talk will be on photophysics of polar materials. Uh, he's a candidate for our condensed matter theory faculty position. So please join me to welcome Dr. Tan. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for having me here. Uh, my talk today is about photophysics of polar materials. And uh, let me start with um, first the concept of symmetry. Um, now, in, in physics, uh, many things are controlled by symmetry. And one of them is the uh, generation of photocurrent. So this is usually what happens. You shine light on some material, and the light gets absorbed, and you generate a current in some direction. Uh, but for this to happen, you need to break uh, inversion symmetry so that the current has some uh, preferred direction uh, of propagation. Now, um, what I'm really interested in, though, is uh, symmetry breaking at a much, much smaller scale. So if you look at materials down to atomic scale, they can break inversion symmetry in many different ways. Um, one way is just simply by having uh, the nuclei be displaced in some direction, and this breaks symmetry. Now the question I would like to answer in my research is how do quantum mechanical effects uh, through atomic scale symmetry breaking uh, affect the uh, presence of uh, photocurrent and how the uh, generation of photocurrent uh, happens in materials, especially quantum materials. So um, the outline for today is, is really uh, two, two interrelated uh, stories. Uh, the first story is uh, the story of halide perovskites. These are uh, materials used uh, for uh, next generation solar cells, but um, there, there are some mysteries into, um, uh, about how they actually operate, and I hope to shed some light on what actually happens in these materials today. Uh, the second uh, related story is the story of photogalvanic effect. Now, photogalvanic effect is an interesting um, quantum mechanical effect, which happens when uh, you generate photocurrent, but you don't do it the usual way by making PN junction. Uh, you, you do it just because the material itself is uh, intrinsically uh, polar. And I will show how the presence of spin orbit coupling can dramatically uh, uh, enhance the, this, uh, these photogalvanic effects. Um, all right, so let's start with the first topic, which is halide perovskites. Um, now, this is a uh, typical perovskite structure. Um, it's usually uh, called an ABX3 structure where you have an A site, uh, a B site, and uh, another site, which is uh, here I call the X site. But in, in this case, I, I really um, in, in, am interested in um, halide atoms, such as iodine, uh, sitting on, on these sites. Um, now, the A site is by far the, the bigger site. And um, in these set of materials, uh, this uh, position is usually occupied by a large inorganic ion, such as cesium or a small organic cation such as uh, methyl ammonium. In this case, this is just uh, CH3, NH3. This is one of the uh, more, more common types of uh, halide perovskites. If you look at the structure from the top, uh, it forms a, um, to, some, uh, to the first approximation, a, a square lattice, um, where this is the A site viewed from the top, and uh, th this uh, B site and the uh, iodine atoms form a square type uh, lattice. So that's the basic structure. Uh, but in, in real life, uh, many things happen to, 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 to uh, create changes in that structure. And uh, all these changes have something to do with symmetry breaking. So uh, you can get rotations of these uh, octahedra here. So they might be rotated this way, or they might be more complicated rotations such as this. You might get displacements of, of ions. So in this case, the A site is displaced uh, upwards. Or the symmetry breaking might come uh, from uh, just uh, the components itself being intrinsically asymmetric. So in this case, this methyl ammonium 
molecular ion is asymmetric because it has a carbon on one, on one side and a nitrogen on the other side, and it's, uh, it's, just, it's polar intrinsically. And all these forms of symmetry breaking uh, uh, will lead to some kind of uh, effects at the quantum level. Um, but before we get into that, let's look at uh, the uh, more applied um, uh, side of the halide perovskites. So um, in particular, this, this one with the, with the organic cation. Um, so this is usually called hybrid inorganic organic perovskite because it has both organic and inorganic components. Um, and if you put this in a solar cell, it performs uh, exceptionally well. Uh, so here is the efficiency of solar cells versus the year that they were fabricated. So in around 2009, you have the first perovskite solar cells. But over the course of maybe five years, um, the efficiency has really sharply increased from below 4% to around 20% today. And some of the other solar cells, okay, here you have um, amorphous silicon and there's this other disensitized solar cells. They have decent efficiency, but uh, the rise in efficiency doesn't uh, really compare to, to what you get in the uh, uh, perovskite solar cells. And um, now this is all very nice, but the problem is that this is a mystery from a physical point of view. Um, the mystery is how, how, how do they perform so well? Um, and so here's, here's you, what usually happens in a solar cell. Um, you have some uh, material, in this case the active material is halide perovskite. You shine light on it and you generate electron hole pairs. And the point of the solar cell is to separate electrons and holes. So there is an electron collecting layer, which is at a different voltage than the hole collecting layer. And if the electrons make it to the electron collecting layer, and if the holes make it to the hole collecting layer, uh, you get some useful current that you can uh, use to do work. Um, but that's a, that's a big if, because somewhere along the way, uh, electrons might get lost, and holes might get lost, and they might recombine uh, and release energy this way. And these are recombination losses which limit the uh, efficiency of a solar cell. So the question in halide perovskites is, why, why are halide perovskites so good at avoiding recombination losses? Why is it that in halide perovskites, most of the electrons and most of the holes escape um, into, the, into the electrodes? Um, so one can perform um, optical measurements to, tr to try to understand this better. Here are some early measurements on the photoluminescence of, the, uh, of these materials. So this is when you shine light on it and, and you let it luminesce. So you measure the light that comes out after some time. And what you see is that some of the uh, electrons and some of the holes, they remain for a very long time in the material, allowing them to luminesce for a long, long time. So even after 50 nanoseconds or hundreds of nanoseconds, there's still some population of electrons and holes uh, in the material. Um, so uh, we can see that electrons and holes are very um, long-lived in the halide perovskite materials. And of course, um, we want to understand why, why this is the case. Um, so I'm a ab initial um, uh, condensed matter theorist, and my uh, method of choice is a density functional theory. Um, this is a theory that en enables you to calculate uh, from first principles um, what happens to the electronic ground state uh, of materials um, uh, just from uh, the input locations of the atoms only. So we have, uh, some, unknown uh, we have some known structure and we want to know what the electrons do uh, in that structure. And the way this is done, very briefly, is by um, introducing this energy functional. So this is just the total energy of the system, including electrons and, um, and ions. Here I'm writing the electronic part. You have the kinetic energy of the electrons. You have the interaction between electrons and ions. There's interaction between electrons themselves, this is, uh, part of it is a simple electrostatic type interaction, usually called Hartree interaction. But there, is, there are more uh, uh, complicated quantum mechanical effects, um, such as exchange interaction and correlation interactions. And these um, are not uh, known exactly, but there are several uh, successful approximations that's been used uh, in the literature, such as um, local density approximation and generalized gradient approximation, and this is um, part of the toolkit that, that, that I use uh, to understand materials. Um, so from DFT, sorry, back. so from DFT, uh, we can calculate many things like the ground state 
and electronic band structure as well as many structural properties. And this is uh, part of the tools that I will use to understand um, the halide perovskite uh, solar cells. All right, so let's, let's return to the topic of uh, symmetry breaking. Um, so in, in the halide perovskites, you have symmetry breaking either from the um, asymmetry of each molecular ion or the uh, displacements of the individual ions. But if you add to that one more ingredient, which is spin-orbit coupling, so this is a relativistic effect coming from uh, interactions between um, uh, the spin of an electron and its orbital degrees of freedom. Um, and this happens when you have uh, heavy, heavy atoms, such as lead, um, and also to some extent cesium and iodine. Um, and when you have these two ingredients, what you get is uh, this uh, type of band structure known as rush bar effect. Now what the rush bar effect does is that it changes a, a two-dimensional, or a rather three-dimensional electron gas um, into something with a split a spin components. So you might have a parabolic band um, without spin-orbit coupling, but if you add spin-orbit coupling as well as broken inversion symmetry, you can get a band structure like this. So the um, excitations of this system will not follow a um, parabolic dispersion relation, but instead be split according to the, uh, the spin degree of freedom. And um, I will show that this is in fact critical for the performance of uh, hybrid perovskite solar cells. Um, so some of the early work, um, early theoretical work on the uh, uh, rush bar effect in hybrid perovskites showed that you get um, this counter-propagating uh, spin uh, structures in the uh, conduction band and also in the valence band. Um, so if you look at the uh, band structure and you take a cut along constant energy and, and ask the question, what are the spins doing in this material, you find that there are two sets of excitations. The inner excitation, um, the inner band, has spins propagating this way, and the outer band has spins propagating in the opposite direction. Um, this can be understood in a simple effective Hamiltonian, usually called Rajba Hamiltonian. There is the usual uh, kinetic energy term, and uh, there is a Rajba term which says that if I have a polar axis, in this case the z-axis, the direction of spin, uh, here denoted by sigma, being the sigma uh, spin Pauli matrix, that direction is dependent both on the uh, direction of the momentum, k, and the uh, direction of the polar axis. Um, which results in this uh, spin structure. Question. Yes, go ahead. You mentioned broken parity symmetry so many times. Why does the Hamiltonian conserve parity? So it, it doesn't. So it, it's an effective Hamiltonian in the sense that th th there is a uh, preferred direction. So, so there is a, a, a z axis here. But it conserves parity. It's even on parity. It's got a, a dot product of a pseudo vector and a sigma. So uh, I think what, all right, so, so basically under, under parity transformation, the uh, direction of the, uh, the polar axis will be changed and the direction of the k will be changed. Um, but uh, I think what happens is that your spin degree of freedom, uh, so if you, if, you, if you apply parity transformation on, on this uh, bench structure, the spins uh, will, will be uh, flipped. So the, the inner band will be um, now clockwise, counterclockwise, and the outer band will become counter uh, clockwise. So, uh, so yeah. So, so if you apply parity transformation to this, it does become a, a different, you know, different variant of this uh, band structure. No. All right. So, um, in uh, this material. Uh, here's an illustration of uh, how, how big the spin orbit coupling actually is. Um, here's the calculation you can do without spin orbit coupling. And here's calculation you can do with spin orbit coupling. And you see that there is a significant change in the, the size of the band gap as well as, as the uh, splitting uh, between uh, the two bands. Um, so the presence of this splitting is really the rush bar effect and also the size of the band gap changes uh, quite a bit. So you see that really um, the size of the spin orbit coupling is not a negligible factor in these materials. Could you, could you, could you clarify? Sure. Could you describe what's the, what's, what's the meaning of the horizontal labeling? What is the ZPRS? What's the meaning of that? 
Uh, right, so, so this is a, um, a bench structure. So it's the uh, momentum of an electron in a crystal. So it's the crystal momentum. Crystal momentum is supposed to be greater than that. Yes, so th this. What's the, what's, the, what's the meaning of this PR? Right, so these are special points in the Brillouin zone. Yes. So uh, yeah, the, the crystal momentum of R is one half, one half, one half in terms of the uh, S is a uh, one half, one half zero, and I think T is. Uh, so the path is is periodic. So uh, you can make a path in K space in, in the Brillouin zone, uh, and you can go around that path. Uh, but the Brillouin, Brillouin zone itself is periodic. So, so you, you're right. So, the, if you just plot a, uh, if you just plot the band structure along a straight line, you get a periodic uh, band structure. But this is not a, a straight line. This is a path in Brillouin zone, which is not a straight line. It, okay. If you, yeah. if you, okay. You have a three-dimensional axis. Yeah. So you have uh, three-dimensional gradient drop. Yes. So, are you saying you cut the diagonal, or you cut it from? It's not in the primary axis. It's in the primary blowing zone, so maybe I'll draw. So, so if my Brillouin zone is, say, square Brillouin zone, um, I can start here, and I can, uh, so this is gamma point, which is the middle of Brillouin zone, and I can plot energy band from gamma to, say, R point, and then from R to maybe S point, and then S back, right? It's a, it's a standard way of plotting. It is usually plotted this way because uh, you want to know what happens at the high symmetry points. Right? Um, so the high symmetry points usually contain band degeneracy such as this. So it's usually uh, useful information to, to have your path pass through multiple high symmetry points. So all these uh, points are usually in the one gradient. Right? Yes, that's right. Um, all right, so going back to the uh, question of rush by effect um, and the uh, effect on carrier lifetime, um, this is uh, our proposal for what happens to uh, excited state electrons and holes when there is rush by effect. So let's say we are in this situation. Um, you shine some light on this material and generate electrons in the conduction band and holes in the valence band. Um, and you have uh, this rush by effect. So you have the splitting of the bands and the uh, spin character of the, the lowest conduction band, say, goes this way. And the spin character of the valence band, let's say, goes the other way. Now this is uh, counter helical, meaning that the uh, spin direction of electron is different than the spin direction of hole. And they do not want to recombine because of spin selection rules. Um, this is one possibility. And in this case, you, you can get a slow uh, recombination rate because the electrons and holes do not want to recombine. And so the carriers will live for a long time in such a structure, and they will um, uh, are likely to contribute to high efficiency of the device if this happens. Um, in another situation, if the uh, spin direction of the valence band is opposite, then uh, this is no longer protected by the spin selection rules, and there can be recombination. And in this case, there can be fast recombination. All right, so I have a question again. Yeah. So if you go back to the previous Brillouin zone, that's the uh, energy band. Yeah. So your energy band is strongly degenerate. So where is your, so in this plot, where, what is the conduction band? Where is that? So, oh, excuse me. So, so here's the conduction band. Um, it's, is degenerate at gamma point, but it's actually split into two away from gamma point. Right, so, so this is the lowest energy, um, the, the lowest energy of, of all the uh, conduction bands. And this is the point of the highest energy of all the valence bands, and this is the valence band minimum. So even you plot in the, the not in the, along the primary axis, so you still think the bottom band is the highest valence band. Yeah, um, yeah, so this, this is, um, in fact, theoretical calculation. So we know how many electrons there are in the, in the simulation. So, yeah. yeah. Um, right. 
So, uh, so here's a more pictorial uh, description of how it works. So you start with a uh, electron in the ground state, and you shine light on it so it gets absorbed into um, excited state. Um, the reason why it goes to this um, upper band is because uh, this lower band and the upper one have the same spin direction. So um, selection rules dictate that it goes to the upper one. And then there is some relaxation, relaxation process. Um, this usually happens very fast in most semiconductors um, of the order of maybe um, uh, hundreds or maybe less than hundreds or tens of fem femtoseconds. Um, what happens is that the electron loses energy by interacting with crystal uh, vibrations or phonons. Um, and this loss in energy brings the electron down to a, a lower energy state such as here but it has to stay on the same spin manifold. So it has to stay on the same band with the, with the identical spin because it again wants to conserve spin. And the same thing happens for the hole. It stays on this band with the same spin and it relaxes to this position. Um, but once that happens, uh, they don't recombine because um, electrons here and holes here have different spin orientation. And also, um, electrons, if you look at the original electron to this hole, the original electron doesn't want to recombine because it's, uh, it has different momentum. And it cannot, uh, uh, this is a, it's not an, uh, a fast process because, you, you, because photons have a zero momentum and you want uh, a zero momentum transition usually in, in materials. Um, so because of this reason, um, both because of the uh, different spin the, uh, orientations and also because of the, uh, uh, the fact that um, the, the, K, the, the momentum of this uh, electron may not be the same as the momentum of the holes here. Uh, because of those reasons, the uh, uh, recombination rate is being suppressed in, in this material. Um, but let me remind you that all this is only possible if, if there's a rush bar effect or the splitting of the bands in the first place. Um, so let's look at this in a different, uh, in a different way. Um, in some sense, this is very interesting because the material behaves as if it has both indirect gap and a direct gap. It behaves as if it's a direct gap material upon excitation, which is usually what you want in materials because direct gap materials have very strong absorption. If you compare that to something like silicon, which is you know, used in uh, solar cells, it has an indirect gap, meaning that the position of the valence band is different than the position conduction band, and this has a very low transition probability. And um, the way this uh, usually works is by uh, simultaneous uh, absorption of phon phonons, and um, this really limits the efficiencies of, uh, or at least the absorptions of solar cells made from silicon. So in contrast, the hybrid perovskites look like they have direct gap upon excitation because they can make these spin allowed uh, transitions. But when you get to the relaxation, after relaxation, when you get to the band minimum, the hybrid perovskites look like they have indirect gap because now this minimum here is in a different place than this minimum or this one. So upon recombination, they have indirect gap, which makes them have long lifetimes. So it's, a, it's as if they have the best of both worlds, right? They have a good absorption because they, they are direct gap upon excitation, but they have bad recombination, uh, which means long lifetimes and good efficiency upon uh, recombination. So th I think this is a very interesting uh, aspect of this material when you have um, a brush bar effect. But for the recombination yeah. transition yeah. do you have uh, uh, selection rules like the crystal lattice has to be the same in each of the phonons? Yes, yes. So, so, so we're, we're looking at the Yeah, th that's because it. Um, no yeah, th th this is a is a different uh, process. Let me go back. Um, so you're talking about this this shifting. Yeah. 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 So this is a is a phonon. This is because it releases a phonon, and this happens on. Um, uh, so it's a phonon transition. Yes, that's a phonon transition. So so this happens regardless of what material you're in, whether it's direct or indirect gap. It always happens. Um, right. 
Okay, so, um, so that's very nice, um, but uh, the question that you might have is whether rush by effect actually exists in real life. And the answer uh, to that is yes. So shortly after we published our paper, um, there was uh, another publication by a different group uh, who did um, angle resolve photo emission spect spectroscopy uh, to measure the bench structure of, the, of this material. And what this is, is that you send in uh, a photon and an electron comes out. You measure the kinetic energy of that electron to find um, the bench structure and the momentum to find the bench structure. And what they see is this ring. In fact, this is the same rush bar ring which I showed earlier um, in a few slides ago. If you make a cut of this ring um, along, let's say, one of the momentum directions and plot, it, plot the energy of the band along that momentum direction, uh, you see this uh, double peak structure, or um, some might say a sombrero type uh, band structure, which is again characteristic of the rush bar uh, effect. So, uh, so in fact, rush bar uh, does exist in, in this class of materials. Yeah, um, that's, that's an excellent question. You don't, you don't know from this experiment. This is a, a, this photo emission, so it doesn't know anything about spin. Presumably, uh, one, could pos one can detect the spins from spin-resolved um, angle-resolved photo emission, but that's a much more complicated experiment. So, uh, these things could have good magnetic properties? Uh, yeah. The magnetic field, what do they do? Yeah, th 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 that's, that's a good question because, um, yeah, I, I will talk about it right now. So, okay, so, um, right, so, so because rush bar effect has something to do with spin, uh, there has to be a, some kind of magnetic probe of the rush bar effect. Um, so before going to any experiments, let's think about what happens uh, just from a purely theoretical point of view. Um, so let's say you're in a situation with no magnetic field. Um, and you consider the spins in the conduction band and the spins in the valence band, or, or the spins of the hole and the spins of the electron. Um, and they can either be spin up or spin down. Um, so in this case, because there is some uh, interaction between electrons and holes, um, they, will pair, they will pair to form uh, states like this. And the uh, spectrum of this, uh, uh, of this, of this uh, uh, Hamiltonian in this situation is just formed by the singlet state and the triplet state. So this, is this usually happens in um, you know, most exotonic materials. You get a singlet exciton and a triplet exciton. Um, and basically, this is just you know, spin up electron paired with spin down hold and the superposition. And the, and the triplet is the one with the um, um, opposite uh, uh, superposition. Now, if you turn on the magnetic field, uh, the electrons and the holes don't want to do this anymore. But in fact, the electrons and holes are energetically prefer, prefer to, uh, to align or anti-align with the magnetic field. So at high magnetic field, electrons or holes want to be either along or, or opposite the magnetic field. And the, um, the solution to the, uh, the states of the system will either be plus half, minus half for hole and electron, or minus half, plus half, uh, which is the higher energy state. OK, so this is what you expect to happen in the magnetic field. And uh, if you put this, if you put this material on the magnetic field, you should see this um, uh, uh, difference in behavior between high field and low field. Um, so, uh, in fact, this is what you hope to get. Um, the states that I talked about in the previous slide are the so-called bright states, meaning that they have um, they luminous, uh, they have uh, non-zero um, optical matrix elements. So uh, they have they should have this kind of dispersion where the energy uh, gap is non-zero at zero magnetic field, and it goes, uh, it splits and becomes linear to magnetic field at high fields, which is just the Zeeman effect. So in fact, you should get a crossover between um, spin orbit splitting at low magnetic fields and Zeeman effect at high magnetic fields. Um, and there are also some dark states which are not observable in the experiment, but uh, they should be there uh, from a theoretical point of view. Um, all right, so this is what we expect. Um, so uh, we told this to some uh, experimental colleagues, and um, they set out to measure um, this effect in nanoparticles. So these are cubic-like uh, nanoparticles of cesium lead bromide. So this is not the organic variant, but the inorganic one. It's the inorganic halide perovskite. So they can take 
individual nanoparticles, so each of these is one nanoparticle, put it under a magnetic field and measure how it luminesces, how it um, emits light. And this is uh, the spectra they get under different uh, magnetic fields. Okay, so at high magnetic fields, they see that there's some splitting. Um, and then as you lower the magnetic, magnetic field, the splitting becomes smaller, as uh, you expect from theory. But at zero magnetic field, it's kind of uh, hard to say whether they're splitting or not, uh, you know, partly because of the resolution of the experiment. Um, so uh, so they, send, they try to, to, get to send this out for publication, but of course the referees um, will say that, or the referees say that you cannot resolve any splitting here, so how can you say that if there's any rush by effect or not from, this, um, uh, from, the, from data of this quality? Um, all right, so um, after further consultation with us um, and a lot and many months of uh, rather um, frustrating work, um, we decided that we really need lots more data. So we got them to uh, measure um, this spectrum and those at the at lower magnetic fields to a much higher degree of precision. And this is what they came up with. Um, so what you're seeing here is um, the positions of each of these two peaks uh, obtained in experiments. So each dot is a each dot here is a the position of one of these peaks from experiments. So you make the experimental measurement of the spectrum and then you deconvolve the spectrum into two peaks and you plot it against magnetic field and this is what you get. And um, so you can see that as you lower the magnetic field, sure enough there is an appearance of a gap uh, at zero, zero magnetic field and this in fact is the um, uh, the spin orbit splitting or the rush bar effect splitting, uh, which we predicted from uh, the theory. Um, okay, so all right, so so that's the story of the rush bar effect. Um, uh, we we managed to see it using the magnetic probe, um, and we managed to uh, use it uh, as an explanation for the high efficiencies of halide perovskites. Um, so I think the combination of these two um, stories makes a very uh, interesting uh, narrative in the sense that um, in, in most uh, optical materials, you don't care about the spin of electrons and holes. They just, uh, they just work without you, you, know, you caring too much about the spin. But these hybrid perovskites or halide perovskites are very interesting in that the spin is really critical for its, uh, its function. Um, all right, so now let me switch on to a, a different, different topic. We have talked about the uh, interaction between spin and optics in halide perovskites. Um, but what I think makes them really interesting is when you introduce a different degree of freedom, which is structural dynamics. So the motions of uh, atoms or, or ions in these materials and um, how this plays with either optics or spin. And that's the, uh, the topic of, of this part of my talk. Um, so this is not a new question. In fact, it's very old. Um, in 1987, uh, what they thought was that um, the, the A site, uh, be it the cesium atom or the, uh, in, or the organic molecule, they thought that that site has a preference to point towards one of these triangular faces in the structure. Um, nowadays, we know that that's not entirely correct. Um, there are some more recent neutron scattering experiments and, and they have reviewed uh, many different uh, modes of orientation. So the arrow represents the, uh, 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 the, the molecular axis of the organic molecule. So th they can be pointing you know, towards uh, one corner or, or rather one face of the, of the unit cell or to one corner or they can have a more uh, wide uh, oscillation like this. Um, but whatever it is, um, th the point is that really all these uh, fluctuations pose a, a challenge for understanding halide perovskites from a theoretical point of view because uh, you cannot get by by just saying that the structure is static and what does the, struct what does the static structure do to the electrons. You really have to understand the structure from a dynamic perspective and I think this is what makes it interesting. Um, and also there's, there's a question of disorder. So is the, is the, are the molecules ordered in this way in the sense that every unit cell is like every other or are they uh, disordered uh, in this way? Or, and if they are disordered, um, are there any correlations between um, you know, neighboring molecules. 
So th these are the types of questions um, that uh, we hope to answer. Um, now, related to order is the question of ferroelectricity. So this is when there is a uh, uh, permanent uh, uh, dipole moment in materials. And you can ask the question of whether halide perovskites are ferroelectric. And the answer you get depends on how you ask. So you might ask using, say, uh, hysteresis measurements, using polarization electric field loop measurements. And you get sometimes yes, and some other pa uh, papers say no. And in fact, it depends. It depends on the scan rate of your, of your measurement. It depends on the crystal size effects. Um, it depends also on the type of measurement you do. So suppose you use uh, piezoelectric force microscopy. So uh, you come in with a device that looks like this. You measure um, basically the polarization of individual uh, uh, domains. And some papers report uh, a picture that looks like this. So uh, uh, this uh, angle here is just the orientation of uh, individual domains. So it looks like there are some 180 degree domains uh, in, this, in this sample. Uh, some other papers report formation of very clean domains like this. So it looks like there are stripes of domains which form in this material. So, um, uh, but not everyone can reproduce this. So this is, I, uh, I would say, still um, uh, somewhat controversial. Um, so to understand the dynamics and the structural uh, properties of these materials, um, we teamed up with a, a different group of experimentalists at Columbia University, um, Louis Bruce, who does a Raman spectroscopy. Um, now the way Raman spectros spectroscopy works is that you send in a photon into the material, it generates electron hole pair, either electron or hole um, uh, knocks into a phonon or generates a phonon and then they recombine and um, you get a, a photon that comes out. Now because of conservation of energy, the photon that comes out and the photon that comes in, um, the difference in those energies is the uh, energy of the phonon. So you can use this to measure the uh, energies of vibrational modes in the material. And, that's, and that quantity is known as a Raman shift. Okay, so um, at low temperatures, uh, this material shows sharp Raman peaks, which correspond to phonons. So they are uh, discretized, um, quantized uh, vibrational modes. But as you increase the temperature, uh, these vibrational modes sort of um, melt into each other and at even higher temperatures, they kind of just smear out and broaden into this one very large uh, diffuse peak. Um, it's hard to say anything from this diffuse peak if you just look at it this way. So what uh, we did is to uh, deconvolve uh, the peak into different uh, the Lorentzian components. And you see that at low temperatures, at 80K, there's one Lorentzian component for every uh, phonon mode. But at higher temperatures, such as room temperature, there's an emergence of a, what you would say, uh, a central peak. So this is a, a rather broad peak centered at zero frequency. And, and it's so broad that um, at any finite frequency, there is some contribution from, from this peak. So it means that um, at finite temperatures or at high temperatures, you get emergence of a continuum of vibrational modes uh, which corresponds to this peak. So, th so there is some kind of vibration which, which is happening at every single frequency uh, at higher temperatures. Um, and, and so what, what, what is this um, vibrational mode? So to understand this, we did theoretical simulation. Uh, in this case, it's a molecular dynamic simulation to calculate the Raman intensities. So uh, it's actually quite simple how you calculate the, the, the intensities of the Raman spectrum. Um, basically, the intensity of the process is just the square of the electric field that comes out, and that's proportional to the square of the polarization that you induce in the material in the first place. The polarization is proportional to the polarizability multiplied by the input electric field, which just says that the um, Raman intensity is just the square of the polarizability. Now, this polarizability is a quantum mechanical object that can be calculated from first principles. Um, it's a fairly standard calculation in that it, it's uh, pretty well described by density functional theory. So what we did is to um, model the dynamics of the, of the material using uh, molecular dynamics and it, at each time step calculate 
the uh, polarizability and then um, Fourier transform it into the, the Raman spectrum. That's the, the basic mode. What, what do you consider the Hohmann mode? At a high temperature, the light is, light is itself has a lot of noise in Hohmann mode. Yeah. At a low temperature, the latency is very quiet. Right. So basically, that would give us, when you have a low temperature, you can yeah. take the uh, Raman signal. The Raman is very clean, very clean, just yeah. one single Hohmann mode. Yeah. So Precisely, yeah. Yeah. And in this calculation, you can use the molecular dynamics, but you cannot recover it. Uh, uh, I, I, think, I think, in fact, you can. Um, because in, in molecular dynamics, you're dealing not with uh, phonon modes, but you're de dealing with uh, actual trajectories of atoms. So, in, so MD, or molecular dynamics, is really a, a, a non-harmonic uh, kind of calculation. So you don't have phonons, except at very low temperatures. But in fact, if you track the trajectories or the movements of each atom, you find that it doesn't follow a parabolic, uh, you know, quantum harmonic oscillator type of motion. It follows. Uh, you don't have periodicity of magic. No, you do have periodicity. So, so, so um, we are in fact doing this in a periodic calculation, um, periodic, periodic molecular dynamics calculation. So it's not a, um, it's not a one by one by one structure, uh, in the sense that we don't. We don't just take a single unit cell and do molecular dynamics. We do molecular dynamics on a, on a huge structure. Uh, so you can say it's a supercell. You can take many, many unit cells, put them together, and do the molecular dynamics of the whole system. And the whole system is periodic. So, um, you know, so, so you do have phonons because of, of that periodicity. Right, right, right. That, that, that's right. There's computational uh, periodicity. But you do still get phonon modes from that. Uh, the is just very, that's just a very secure mode because there are two that can be one and two. Actually, actually it's, it, it's, it's, it's a, let's say it's a computational trick, okay? So it's a, okay, all right, yeah. Uh, the, the, well the, the point is that you, you do get phonon modes and those are actual phonon modes, but the way you interpret them is that uh, you have to make a, a folding of the Brillouin zone uh, to get from uh, the, the, the the computation with many unit cells to the one with small unit cells, but okay, we can we can discuss that. Um, all right, so um, all right, so here's the result of the simulation. Um, we do molecular dynamics um, and calculate the Raman. Uh, we get this curve in red, and the experimental curve is in blue. Um, so we do see the broadening of the uh, phonon peaks at high temperature compared to low temperature. And we also see the uh, emergence of this central peak uh, in our calculation. Um, and OK, so for low temperature, you do get the more sharp uh, phonon modes. Um, all right, but that's just a spectrum. And we really want to find out uh, what's happening to the structure, which ultimately is more interesting. So um, we took a look at the structure. And at low temperature, nothing much happens. It just um, looks like this and oscillates about this average structure. Um, but I, I would point your attention to this shape. Okay, so one unit cell and the next one have a, one is like horizontal and the other one is vertical. And um, the reason why this is important happens, uh, comes when you look at the high temperature structure. High temperature structure looks cubic on average. So if you run the MD simulation, <coughs> on average you get the colored positions, which is square lattice or mostly cubic. But instantaneously, it's in fact very far from cubic. And um, in fact, instantaneously, what it looks like is this. So at any point in time, the structure is oscillating between this shape and this shape locally. And the reason why that's interesting is because remember that there's, there's something that sits inside. And that something, in this case, is cesium. And so it hops <coughs> between one local minimum here and another local minimum here. So if you plot the tra trajectory of this atom, it looks like it's oscillating about one minimum. And then all of a sudden, the structure flips from this horizontal to the vertical one. And then um, the, the cesium moves over to the other one. So this is inherently a uh, very enharmonic process in the sense that uh, the, the vibration isn't just happening in a single potential minimum, but there's a lot of uh, switching between different competing potential minima. Um, and this is what drives the uh, central peak. Uh, 
in the Raman spectrum uh, because it's highly enharmonic. Um, so here's a movie uh, that kind of illustrates what's happening. Let me see if I can play it. All right. So the, uh, the color, uh, the blue balls are the position of cesium. Um, and this uh, red or green means the size of this uh, particular uh, square plaquette um, that separates each cesium from, the, from its neighbor. If it's red, it means that this window is contracting. If it's green, it means that window is expanding. And what you're supposed to see here is a correlation between uh, events where the cesium atoms move towards each other, uh, like in this way, with an opening of the window. So you should <coughs> see that when cesium approaches each other, such as this or this, the uh, window between them um, turns green. Let me play that one more time. So like this. All sorts of different motions go in with these cesium, right? Some go in a circle and... Right, yeah, yeah. So there's no coherence across them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a highly uh, disordered. Um, it's, it's highly disordered. But what you can say is on, on average, you do get a uh, preference for events uh, like, uh, like this, where they move towards each other and the square between them turns green. There's a preference for that. Yeah. How, many, how many unit cells are you looking at? Uh, this simulation was two by two by two unit cells. So you're looking at the periodic image of... So that's yeah. what you were really, yeah, looking at, right? Yeah, now. yeah. So you basically have this super periodicity on top of the uh, the sim I, I don't know what you mean by super periodicity. So, so in your molecular dynamic simulation, you have to use the periodic, periodic sure. periodic condition to, to do the simulation. Yeah. So on top of this, you use periodic. Periodic. Yeah. You do two big cells. Right, right. So that means you impose the, the symmetry on this cell. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, th th that's true. So. We do impose some symmetry, but it's a, a pretty low symmetry in that 2 by 2 by 2 is uh, actually a pretty large uh, supercell already. Um, there what are... The, what the wave function in this? What wave function? Yeah, what the wave function in this simulation? It's a, it's a quantum mechanical calculation, so it's, it's DFT. So we solve the Kuhn-Sham equation. So and you solve the wave function, I mean the resulting wave function, is that a pure force by Broca? Yes, yes, yes. So pure yes, yes. Um, all right, so, so, so there are a few things you can learn from this. First is that, uh, oh, excuse me. So halide perovskites are, are polar, I think, but they're polar in a very special sense. They're only locally, and for short periods of time, they are polar. And, but that's enough uh, to generate uh, enough um, symmetry breaking in the material. And really, uh, the questions of you know, whether it's ferroelectric or not, all these discussions, um, I think we, we have to keep uh, in the back of our minds the timescales of these uh, measurements because uh, it's, it's only with the, uh, the right experiments, such as Raman in this case, that you're, you're able to probe the dynamics of the, uh, the, the, the material. If you're doing something like X-ray diffraction, you may say that this, this is cubic, end of story. Uh, but in fact, there's a lot more that's happening if you look at it with the right uh, timescales. Um, so, um, so actually, this is only for the ground state. Uh, these structural fluctuations are only happening uh, in the ground state in, in these MD simulations. Um, but what is really uh, important, I think, is to move beyond the ground state and to think about how the excited state influences the structural fluctuations and how the structural fluctuations inf influence the excited state. And this, um, I think, will, will um, guide uh, uh, research in this area in, in the future. Um, we have some ideas on how to do that. Uh, we can attempt ab initio simulation of excited states, although this is horribly uh, expensive, but in smaller supercells, um, it, it might be possible. Um, or, you can, uh, or we can consider using excited state model Hamiltonians to access uh, some of these uh, um, excited state dynamics. Um, another direction I would like to pursue is the spin manipulation of structure or structural manipulation of spin. So we have talked about how spin and um, optics interact, but spin and structure itself I think is interesting in the sense that you know, if you put in a, sp a spin polarized uh, excitation to the system, what happens to the structure? How does it rearrange to, uh, to form something else? Or if you 
uh, deform the structure, how, how, how can you get any useful spin information out of it? I think these are further questions that uh, have yet to be answered. All right, um, so now let's move to another topic in the remaining amount of time I have. Um, and this is the topic of photogalvanic effect. Um, this is uh, somewhat different from what's happening before. Um, uh, in the previous slides, I talked about linear absorption. So it does take electron in conduction band excited to one band up in the valence band. This is the first order process. It happens um, uh, in, 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 in every semi semiconductor. Um, but you can get a different process um, where if instead of taking this electron and putting it into one band, you put it into superposition of many bands. So you form wave packet because um, that's superposition of many bands. And if you arrange the wave packet such that it has a certain velocity, it has a group velocity, that wave packet will propagate and you get the current. So this is in fact creation of current from, from light. And that's an inherently different process than just linear absorption. Um, and this process has been called shift current mechanism. And it's, uh, um, it was discovered maybe about uh, 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 sometime in, in the last century, maybe in the 70s. Um, and it has also been measured experimentally. So if you just take a bulk material, uh, like uh, barium titanate, for, for instance, put it between two identical electrodes so that at first sight, there might be no preference for the current to go to, to either one, um, and shine light on it. And if you shine light on it, in fact, the current goes to one of the electrodes rather than the other one. And the reason for that is because barium titanate itself is inherently um, polar and it inherently breaks symmetry. So uh, there is current flowing in, in some preferred direction. And you can get photocurrent versus voltage curves like, that look something like this. Um, all right, I, I will skip this in the interest of time. Basically, uh, this effect is related to nonlinear optics in the sense that it's a, it's a zero frequency effect. Um, all right, so we decided to investigate um, how to make photogalvanic effect big, how to get a, a good efficiency or how how to enhance uh, such effects. And something that drew our attention, and this goes back to the uh, discussion of spin and rush bar effect, is the, uh, is the relation um, with topological physics, which um, also has to do with the spin a degree of freedom. Um, the material we picked for study is this layered material, bismuth telluride, I bismuth telluride iodide. And um, what you can do with this material is that you take its normal band structure, you put it under pressure, and it becomes, uh, you get uh, an electronic transition in the sense that the conduction band um, has gone down in energy and the valence band has gone up in energy, and you get a band structure that looks like this with the color representing the um, character of the band. So in this case, it's the bismuth component. So if it's a normal insulator under low pressure, uh, the uh, valence band is mostly bismuth, but at higher pressure, there's this twisted uh, property which makes it a topological insulator. All right. And the question is, how does this affect the optical uh, properties of the material? <coughs> um, and in fact, it, it, does, it does change the, optic, the optics to a very large extent. So here's what happens. Um, in the normal insulator phase, you get this kind of photogalvanic effect. We can calculate this from first principles theory. And as you put it under pressure, it starts to approach the uh, band inversion transition. So its band gap goes smaller, it becomes smaller. So this peak in the current, in the photocurrent becomes, uh, it goes to slower frequencies. But at the same time, there, there is an enhancement in the magnitude of this peak. So there's a strong enhancement in the photogalvanic effect and then as you just cross this transition, as it becomes just, uh, as it crosses from just um, uh, normal insulator to, to, to topological insulator, you get sudden switch in the direction of the current. You get change from this green curve to the yellow one. And then as you comp compress it even more, it stays in the topological phase uh, and it gives this kind of photocurrent, uh, which is still very large compared to the uh, normal phase photocurrent. So basically, two things happen. Um, you made it a topological insulator, and number one, the phase, um, the direction of the current changed, and uh, number two, it was strongly enhanced near the transition. Um, so we want to understand uh, why there is a such uh, 
enhancement. Uh, and again, it comes down to the uh, spin physics. So to understand this, we performed a model Hamiltonian study. Basically, uh, the electronic structure looks like this. Conduction band is mostly P states of bismuth, and valence band is P states of tellurium and iodine. Um, and there's also a spin degree of freedom, which we uh, consider, uh, which we denote as sigma. Um, in the simplest case, uh, we have a Dirac model where uh, um, you get linearly dispersing, dispersing uh, bands, uh, very similar to graphene. Um, but to build up uh, a model which describes this material, you actually need a few other terms. One of those other terms is a mass term, which breaks this degeneracy and um, creates uh, a band gap uh, because this material is a semiconductor. And the other thing that you need is the presence of polar axis. Um, and, and with this term in the, in the Hamiltonian, you can change this mass term into, um, you can change this type of dispersion into a rush bar type dispersion. And in fact, that's the uh, dispersion of the uh, material. So having a Hamiltonian like this enables us to track what happens to the band structure and hence the photocurrent as you change the material's parameters. So um, basically what you do when you compress it is that you change the sign of the mass term from negative to positive because that describes um, an interchange of valence and conduction bands. So um, you can show that once you have this Hamiltonian, the photogalvanic response um, follows this kind of behavior where you have the uh, photoconductivity being proportional to a prefactor multiplied by the density of states multiplied by uh, this mass. So as the mass changes from positive, positive to negative, the conduction band and valence band change places and you get reversal of photocurrent. Uh, the enhancement of photocurrent comes because of this factor of one over omega squared and basically it's a result of the band gap becoming very small during the uh, band inversion transition. All right, so to summarize, uh, we have observed, uh, in theory, uh, reversal of photocurrent and its enhancement in topological insulators, and we are currently still waiting for experimental uh, observations of this. Um, so I think this area of uh, uh, nonlinear optics and photogalvanic effect has uh, uh, a lot of opportunities for future research because it's not very well understood yet, especially for topological materials. Um, in, in topology, uh, at least in uh, band structure topology, uh, many people just um, uh, are aware of and mostly care about uh, transport phenomena because there is a uh, topological edge state which is supposed to be uh, protected in transport. But the, uh, um, this influence on optics, I think, um, is something that we, we, we have to think about uh, more. Uh, and I think that there could be a huge uh, uh, effect on, on optics as shown by um, uh, what I, I showed just now. And, um, but it has to be understood better. So I think there is a, a need for a more in-depth uh, study in the sense of whether topological materials are generically better or instead of just uh, better in one case, as I showed just now. Um, there is some ongoing work which I'm working on uh, regarding fundamental limits of photogalvanic effect. And I think that the methodology uh, that's being put into this work can be applied to other types of nonlinear optical phenomena, such as second or high harmonic generation, but for the interest of time, I cannot go into today. Um, all right, so let me uh, just make a quick summary. Um, first, we have um, local uh, polar fluctuations in halide perovskites. Uh, I showed that these materials are cubic uh, nominally on average, but in fact, they have a very, very rich structural dynamics, which is in fact, very far from cubic and very far from symmetric at any point in time. Um, I only got to talk about one uh, work today. Uh, there are several other works, some of them collaborations with experimental um, collaborators on how structural fluctuations manifest themselves in various um, ways. We showed that the structural fluctuations through the rush bar effect can enhance the lifetime, explaining the efficiency of the materials. And in fact, the rush bar effect is uh, um, uh, observed an experiment, um, which we showed using magneto optics. And finally, we discussed uh, photogalvanic effect and topological insulators, where I think there's a much room for further a future study. So finally, let me thank uh, all my um, collaborators. Uh, most of them are experimentalists, um, and also my um, postdoctoral advisor, 
Andrew Rapp in the University of Pennsylvania, and my thesis advisor, uh, Stephen Louis at UC Berkeley. So thank you all for your attention. Yes. Yeah. The, the last ones you showed, the, the two by two, by two ones, those were ab initio. Those are ab initio, yes. But the ones before that were classical, is that correct? Or did you, or were there no classical simulations? Either? There were classical simulations, but not in this work. So, ah, okay. uh, yeah, so, so okay. there were some others, yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so have you thought about just to test, because, you know, it's, it's still a fairly small system, yeah. two by two by two. Yeah. I, mean, I, I agree, you know, you're, you're doing ab initio, so that's basically all you can do. Yeah. So the question is, is have you looked maybe just to see what the size, magnitude of the size effects are by actually doing a, uh, a larger classical MD simulation. Yes. Just to, just to compare the classical MD simulation for the 2x2x2 two by two by two and a much larger MD simulation right. to see if the fact that you're cutting off the phonon mode is right. consistent. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good question. So um, um, in terms of dynamics, if you stick to even numbers, if you stick to 2, 4, and 6, it's OK. But if you go to 3, uh, like 3 by 3 by 3 that gives you problems. And the reason for that is because of rotations of the octahedra. So maybe I can go back to the... Um, okay, so yes. So this, this type of rotation, this is not commensurate with uh, odd numbered unit cells. So. Um, so in some sense, you need to know that this happens. Uh, and, and, and we do know that it happens if you go to very large unit cells. Mm -hmm. And I think that as long as you stick to even number, like 2 by 2 by 2, it's, it's okay. It's so, not so you see convergence at least in the even number? Right, one yes. Number. Yeah, yeah. Can you show the slide of that large parabola? Sure. sure. This one, yeah. Oh, no, the other one. I like the other one. Oh, the other one. Uh, <laughs> This one. Looks like, looks like two cups in front of each other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe this one? Or the other one. Yeah. Okay, so it, it looks like you have a, a degenerate ground state. And uh, why don't you have some spontaneous symmetric breaking? Oh, OK. Uh, the, the reason for that is it's not perfectly uh, degenerate. So crystal symmetries break the degeneracy. So, so yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's enough. Yeah, there's, there's the, but the Hamiltonian you wrote down from Rajput yeah. didn't have that in it. Yeah, th that's an approximation. You're, you're yeah. leaving all that stuff out. I'm leaving that out. Th that's right. Rajput is the band structure from the crystal. And then there's that kind of spin orbit coupling. Um, so, so one tuning knob is the type of atom you use. Um, we have lead and iodine. And in fact, both are already very heavy atoms. So there's actually not much uh, room for going to even heavier atoms in that, in, that, uh, in that direction. You can go to a little bit heavier um, uh, by just, uh, instead of having methyl ammonium, so instead of having the organic part be, be light, you can make it heavy, like in cesium. And that should give a bigger rush bar effect. Um, uh, but that, that's not the only direction. So instead of just changing the type of atom, you can also change um, uh, the symmetry breaking. So, um, so remember that the rush bar effect is a product of both the uh, spin orbit coupling and the, uh, and the amount of polar distortion. So I think by designing materials with large polar distortion, you might be able to increase the rush bar effect. So uh, by large polar distortion, you can think of it as either using uh, maybe molecular components with high dipole moment, or maybe somehow doing something to the lattice, maybe introducing defects or introducing 
um, uh, maybe other more complicated uh, defect structures where uh, you can locally at least make, make the structure more polar. Uh, you know, at least something that, that, that destroys the, uh, the symmetry. Yes. How robust are your results with respect to the functional that you choose? I mean, what, do, can yeah. you use really simple functionals, or do you have to include dispersion and other Oh, oh yes, oh yes. It's, it's extremely important. You, we have to include dispersion. Okay, so um, you're using a Mandelbrot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, oh. Yeah, so, oh, yeah. yeah, so I use SMU results. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so I'm using Mandelbrot here. Right, right. Okay. Um, but, okay. yeah, and I was, I was going to say that, um, uh, with regards to the, the band structure, um, it, I mean, of course, it's very important what functional use for the band structure. Um, but regardless of the functional use, you always get the rush by effect because that, that's not exactly. band structure dependent. Okay. So that's, 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 that's qualitative. Yeah, robust. right, right. Yeah, in, in, uh, in optimizing your for example, if you use just the two by two by two yeah. ladder, how do you take care of the ladder and just do it? How do you, what do you do to preserve the process? Um, okay, so w when you have the uh, supercell, uh, or the, uh, the, the Wait a minute. Yeah. Can I have two by two by two? Yes, yes. Uh, oh, you mean an isolated two by two by two? Yeah, you, so basically the um, top of two by two by two is a, is a QRD to be imposed with computation, which is like the So where is the, or is the ladder supposed to be, you, you have a QRD to be, is using QRD? So I'm, I'm a bit confused about what you're asking. So, so you're saying that I, in my... Okay, it, for the, for the block away, yeah. you have uh, two QR distribution, one is using QR and then QR distribution for each unit cell. So I, I think there's only one period. Th there's only the period of the unit cell. I, I don't know what you mean by infinite periodicity. Uh, you mean the, the ladder to be using, that gives you the ladder. So, 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 so right. So you're basically saying so it's I periodic. Okay, yeah, yeah. M maybe I can explain it this way. So, so you have a Hamiltonian, um, and that Hamiltonian you can write it in a non-periodic way, like in terms of spatial coordinates, right? Or you can write it in a periodic way in terms of momentum. So, in fact, what you do in DFT is you write it in terms of the momentum. So, the Hamiltonian you have a separate Hamiltonian for every momentum, right? So, so the the full mo full Hamiltonian is decomposed into momentum for every momentum, sorry, Hamiltonian for every momentum, and you solve each Hamiltonian for every momentum, and that's how you have the uh, periodic band structures. You, you cut off this momentum cutoff with the two by two by two. Uh, so, so instead of a cutoff, it's actually discrete momenta. Yeah, th th that's an interesting question. But actually, the spin lifetime is uh, is, is not of such great importance um, because what what you need really is that the uh, electrons and holes somehow make their way down into this uh, lowest energy state. So it doesn't matter how they get there; they might get there from phonons, which I think is the more is a stronger effect here, or they might get there maybe by spin scattering. Th that's possible, but it doesn't really doesn't matter how they get there as long as they end up in the lower state. Uh, which is uh, yeah, yeah. So you're saying it might end up here, yeah. right? Yeah, but but it, it actually doesn't matter because um, if you if you think of a thermal distribution, so if you think of a thermal distribution with equal populations in either valley, really all you need is that this thermal distribution has a different spin than 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 this one. So it doesn't matter how you get to that thermal distribution, whether it's spin scattering or phonons, you just need to set it up somehow in the first place. Okay, uh, so this is our time. Uh, let's start with writing questions, and let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.